and governments around the world very much intend to base policy on this analysis. Here's a slide from the government of the Canadian province of British Columbia from August of 2016. And this is from an administration that was widely regarded as being right of center. Their plan was to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide and equivalents by nearly 80% in the next 33 years. That's a drastic policy response. It doesn't just mean that the oil and gas sector won't be producing this stuff, it means Canadians won't be using it. We won't be using fossil fuels to heat our homes, cook our food, or get around. In fact, the governments of both France and the United Kingdom, the latter, again, under a conservative administration, have both announced that they will ban the sale of gasoline and diesel powered cars by 2040. In Canada, there's no such official intention yet. But what matters isn't the formal ban, it's that governments around the world intend to make it impossible to use gasoline as fuel in automobiles. And that includes the government of Ontario. Here's slide 37 from that February 2017 webinar. Essentially, they seriously intend that we shall stop giving off carbon dioxide. We may be able to use petroleum products to manufacture plastics and pharmaceuticals, things of that sort, but not as fuel. And the government of New Brunswick, one of Canada's Atlantic provinces, same thing. This is from their May 2016 Building a Stronger New Brunswick Response to Climate Change discussion guide. It's just a discussion guide. They don't have a plan yet, but they do have an intention, and that is a 75 to 85 percent reduction in the use of fossil fuels by the year 2040. In November 2016, the Canadian government made a similar commitment while admitting it had no idea how to get there. But I don't want to be too sarcastic about that. People, including the Conference Board of Canada, are fumbling with the question of implementation, and rightly so, because, again, if the alarmists are right about what's happening, and what's causing it, we must find some way dramatically to reduce emissions and live with it. And this is the orthodoxy. Barack Obama campaigned on that goal in 2008, and he reaffirmed it as late as 2015. The Swedish government has endorsed it, and the German government is on board, with plans for a 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030, and 80 to 95% by 2050. The British government made an 80% reduction in carbon and equivalents pledge a decade ago. A Google search in June 2017, 80% reduction in carbon emissions, yielded almost 2 million hits. This too is orthodoxy. Or rather, it's orthodoxy that we start there. Another publication by the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, this one in 2016 called Facing Climate Change, in a little sidebar, indicated that 80% is just an initial target. Ultimately, the goal is to get to zero or even less. A number of people are talking quite seriously about trying to get some of the CO2 out of the atmosphere that they blame humans for having added over the last 50 or 150 years. And here I think we can fault the alarmists to some extent for downplaying the impact on our lives of the changes that they insist are necessary, particularly in essentially ceasing to use conventional fossil fuels politicians, I understand, they're in the business of promising that if you let them, it'll be all gain and no pain. But analysts and scientists should have been more forthright about the fact that, as a recent National Post article put it, when children are taught about climate change and told to do something virtuous, they're not told it means essentially giving up plane travel, ceasing to eat meat, having even smaller families than we already do. But again, if the crisis is as real as the alarmists say, we must find some way to stop it, however difficult and painful it may be. For that reason, I won't be saying much in this documentary about the colossal failure of state-sponsored alternative energy schemes around the globe, from Ontario to Germany to Australia. I think it's due partly to the inherent weaknesses in some of the technology, and partly to the fact that even when governments are doing something essential, they tend to have something of a reverse Midas touch. I think it should worry backers of this kind of energy, because it does sour the public on it. But if we face imminent climate catastrophe, we must take drastic steps to save ourselves and the planet, and if one thing fails, we try another. We might prefer that these remedies not come at the cost of prosperity. But if we're in danger of wiping out human civilization and a third to half the species on Earth, then the humanitarian and ecological as well as economic costs of inaction are so enormous that almost literally no price is too high to pay to prevent it from happening. I hope that's clear. 
What I hope will become clear in the course of this documentary, though, is that the alarmists are not right. Readily available, widely accepted scientific facts contradict their whole position.